organization. Are you looking to outsource your testing activities and all of that? Neto solution is the go-to place for you. So I would like to start by just giving us a brief introduction of our speaker. He's going to deep dive, in, deep dive into that later. His name is Ayodele Akimbun. He's already waiting on the call loaded. And um, he has about five years of experience. He currently works as a senior software engineer. And um, he, he used to work at Neto Solution. And also you have um, a link to his profile. So what are we going to be looking at today, which is continuous integration and continuous deployment. So during the course of this session, we are going to understand what continuous integration is. Why should we even think about it? What is continuous deployment? Why should we even think about continuous deployment? What are the benefits of CICD, which is continuous integration and continuous deployment? And how do you even think, what are the process to actually implement CICD? So without wasting too much of time, I'll, I'll just hand over the session to Ayadele Akimbo. Mm. So thank you. Over to you, Ayadele. Yeah, thank you so much, Mubarak. Very grateful. Thanks for the introduction. Um, good day, everyone. Depending on where you're at, um, my name is Ayadele, and I think Mubarak actually did justice to introducing me, so I don't want to waste too much time on that. But just to sort of say that, um, uh, you know, to say a big thank you to Neto Solutions for the opportunity to be doing this today. Um, I understand that also, like, this is depending on where you are at again, like the wee hours in the evening. So I don't want to take so much of our time today. And um, I'm hoping that, just like Mubarak said, that we'll be able to look through continuous integration and continuous delivery and essentially speak to uh, to like what exactly it is in the first place why 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 is it important and why do why do organizations you know spend a lot of resources trying to ensure that they can establish the ground for CIC in within their software and workflow either development testing and what have you so those are some of the things we'll be looking at today just a bit of a motivation just to give an idea to um whom for instance this would be very beautiful. So if you have just started say any form of as a matter of fact, any form of um a tech career, whether it is software testing or software development or you're in products design, and you probably come across the term CI C D and you don't know what it is, or maybe you've heard about it before, but it isn't something that it, you know, fully understand, or you have someone who's maybe working in a place, for instance, and you you always you know that you know that it is a common technology at work, or you probably see the, the pipelines, for instance, but you don't really know it's a setup or what it is there to do. This webinar is for you. In this webinar, we'll be talking about the importance of CICD. The common practices around CI/CD and um, the tools or the infrastructures that are used to, um, let's say, full style facilitate CI/CD pipelines in software development uh, organizations. So, those are some of the things to look at. But just to, to also share um, some context to my background, Mubarak has said most of it, but I like to establish this just so that I can probably motivate a few people who are, you know, who find themselves in that situation at the moment. I um, didn't start off as a software engineer, basically. I, I basically studied, I studied mechanical engineering in the university, and I also did a bit of industrial automation for about a year. And then when I was, I think, a year after that, I started to think of, we all understand, for those that are in Nigeria, we all understand the way that the employment um, market or the employment situation is uh, there isn't so many jobs where you can actually find um, fulfillment, not just in terms of the amount of impact you'll be able to make, but um, in terms of remuneration or like pay, you know. And it was at a time when the certifications and your degree in school can only get you so far. So, like, I decided to make a transition into 
engineering, I mean, software engineering, basically. I didn't really know so much about software engineering at the time, but I wanted to do that. So that was, and fortunately, um, a couple of people were there to sort of assist me, helping me to understand, you know, where to find my footing and all of that. So a couple of years after that, you know, I found myself doing software engineering, but I used to work as a software tester before. I did that for a couple of months, and then I made that transition. And it's been five years now, and I'll say that it's been truly rewarding. Yeah, it can be stressful sometimes and can be challenging, but it's been truly rewarding. And what I'm saying this is so that if, for instance, you if you find yourself in a position where you have just made that transition into a software-related profession, whether it is um, you know from the non-coding parts to the coding parts, just know that you are not alone, and a lot of people have walked this path too before, so. You're going to be fine, you know, and that's something I wanted to mention. And also for people who are just joining the webinar for the very first time, they yeah, also know alone. This is my first webinar session that I'll be taking myself. So, I mean, yeah, there is a first for everyone. Like you, we are in good company today. So, that's how much I can say about the introductions. So I'll be going into continuous integration. But before I go into continuous continuous integration, um, you know, I want this to be, an like um, an interactive session. Let me. I want to get a few for how many people on the call currently. So we've got nineteen. Okay, nineteen people. So I would have said to take um introductions, but again, like I don't want to take too much of our time to do so. I'll skip the introduction, but um, hopefully. I might just call on anybody on the call if you, if, if, I mean, in between, maybe just answer a couple of questions to be sure that we are following. And also, if you want to ask questions, you don't have to wait till the end of the session. Just feel free to ask your questions at any point. Yeah. I call up. So, yeah, so let's get into it. So, um, yeah, I've, met, I've spoken about this already in background. So, Unless there are questions for me on that one. Hmm. All right. So, um, so does anyone have an idea of what CICD is? I just want to get a few for how much you know about this. CICD, is this something that you are familiar with? If it is, please feel free to speak about it for a bit. So just essentially speak about what you know um, or you understand by CICD. If you can, anyone. Does anyone have an idea of what CICD is? Can you guys hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Awesome. Okay, Ibuku, Ubola, please feel free to share your opinions. Ibuko, I can see you raising your hands. Can you go? Yeah, can sorry, excuse me. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, continuous um, CICD. We have um, um, the continuous integration and um, continuous deployment. Okay. So what what do you understand by the term continuous integration and continuous deployment? Okay, so what do you have I an understanding that? of it? Do I have a... Do you know what it means? Yes, I know what it means. Okay. I should can you, can you explain? Time. Yeah, can you just explain to us? All right, so, um, yeah, so what I understand by CICD, um, um ci is a continuous integration and that continuous integration is um is when we are pushing to the pipeline and uh, for the pipeline to also run our code that's why we are doing the um continuous integration yes so continuous yeah. deployment is when um you already push your code to the pipeline and um you schedule um you make a schedule meant for it to be running always that is 
um, um, continue the deployment to pull and to push. Okay, thank you so much, Popola, for that. Does anyone want to try again apart from Popola? Is anybody willing to try? All right. So, uh, I would just say that Popola is not very far away from the true meaning, but the, the whole idea, what, why, I, why I decided to ask is so that in case you know, I just want to get a feel for what we all understand. And if we all agree to what Popola said, then I imagine I'll just take it up from there. But one thing we'll try to do today is to demystify some, some terminologies or linguists that you would come across in, you know, relating to continuous integration and continuous delivery. One of them is the, the term pipeline, right? So if, like I said, I imagine some people are like, uh, a bit new to this oral concept. So I want to make sure that I can get a few for what we understand and be able to know how to take it out from there. So I would just, I would go as basic as possible so that hopefully we'll be able to learn something from this. So before I tell us, or like before I explain what continuous integration of continuous delivery is, I mean, at all delivery or de deployment is, I like to speak about some motivations as well. Like I, I, I think or the idea of why, why continuous integration. And to explain this, I would say a bit about like what I experienced when I started software development. About five years ago, right? About five, six years ago, we all know like, or at least a good number of us today are familiar with the term um, version control, right? Or um, remote repositories or a central repository server, right? And some of the most popular ones are GitHub, GitLab, um, Bitbucket, and a couple other ones, right? And they essentially allow us to make contributions quite easy and collaboration easy these days. But back in the day, or I mean, like if you have to think about it again, it is back in the day is really relative. Um, so my context is the Nigerian technology ecosystem. When I started development. GitHub wasn't quite popular, or what we know as this version control tools to be, were not very, very popular. So what used to happen is that once you are working in silo, basically just cracking out, I mean, cracking away on your computer with maybe a couple of things you're doing, like writing some code, right? When you do that to a point, and uh, maybe you want to share your code with someone, or say you want to, or maybe you're working on an aspect of a particular application, someone else is doing the same thing too. What usually happens is that people upload those um that code they've written or the piece of um program they've written into some um they, maybe they just they just push it into a flash drive or something and then they they share that flash drive with I mean the other person who is also contributing with them at the point where they want to maybe so you know combine those contributions together. So they will share, they use, they used to share maybe through media files, YouTube, whatnot. And once they do that, they will be able to, then they now sit down and then they have maybe they do peer program where they try to resolve all the possible changes that they've made so that they don't wind up like losing previous changes. And what I found very difficult about that was that there were situations where, for instance, like, I had maybe because I was not available in that moment, I had shared like my code with someone else, maybe through um email, for instance, through mailing or through um uh, what's it called now? Um say I just upload it to Google Docs or something and then I ask them to go and download it then. It might not be Google, it could just be another central place again. But then what usually happens, or like in my experience, at least one thing that happened before was that I once pushed and then I was shared my code with someone. And then after a while, some of those, some aspects of those um, of that code was missing. And basically the person said they couldn't find it there or they didn't see it. But there was no way to really verify whether or not that person got the entire piece of code that had written earlier, you know, because there was no versioning. So those are some of the difficulties you find with the orthodox way of sharing or collaborating with people generally, you know, when working on a project. So that's one very huge motivation for continuous integration because 
when continuous integration became um, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah it looks like someone else yeah okay cool so i guess what i'm trying to say is that continuous integration became very very important because um collaboration was quite difficult without it it wasn't like people didn't quite collaborate but there were so many issues with collaborating like you know essentially losing track of very important co-contribution or not being able to track like you know the um the changes that was being introduced to a central code base, for instance, but not knowing basically how to sort out issues relating with um people's contribution when there are conflicts and all that stuff. So that's one one of the reasons why consensus integration became very important. And the idea is this: integration in itself means combining things together, right? And then continuous means like the ability to continue to do. Yeah, I don't mind me saying, <laughs> I don't mind my the fact that I had to use continuity, but the whole idea is to, you know, consistently and frequently integrate or like, pull, I mean, add things together to be able to make sure that they are all working fine and they can all be in the central place. So today, like one of the most familiar tools that we know today, you know, where people sort of put things together and are able to reuse them or to consistently track them is with the version control tools, isn't it? So, well, as I said, um, you know, version control tool basically isn't the only thing that is used within the CI CD setup, right? And we're going to be going into some of those things as we go on. So now let's go to the meaning of continuous integration. Practically, what does continuous integration really mean? It's like a practice in software where in software development, or you could say um, software development lifecycle, where code contributions are um, effectively managed in the sense that they can, you know, um, be focused into pockets of um, features. People can, you can call that maybe some type of user story implementation and then or a tax implementation and then once all these pockets of um, tasks probably assigned to maybe one developer or two developers depending on how you know it's is set up they can have those contributions in something called a branch if that's some if you're familiar with the um github i mean the popular yeah i'll i'll say github as context because not every fashion control tool has the um, idea of, or uses the idea of branches, right? So, but if you're familiar with data for instance, like code contributions usually are done within branches and then those various branches can, you can have, for instance, like a reference or a base branch where the most updated or the um, most reliable piece of code or the most stable rather piece of code exists on, and then, Every other developer, or I won't say developers, you know, depending on who they create, you know, branches of the main or creates their own pockets of isolated work off of that main branch. And then they can contribute their own changes to that main branch. So, so raise a PR or a merge request or a pull request. From there, people can review those pull requests and have those, have those changes once they've passed um, all the possible checks matched into the main repository, I mean, the main branch of, yeah, the most stable part of the code. So just to sort of reintegrate and re-explain what, what I'm really trying to say, you know, continuous integration allows us to continuously add, you know, little changes to a stable code base in an effective manner where you can sort of validate that those changes that are being added to um, the repository, or would I say, the main piece of the most stable piece of code are correctly checked for, I mean, for errors, for inconsistencies, for issues that might essentially break the application before they are allowed to go into the main, um, the main branch. So this is, um, you know, a way to sort of describe continuous integration, and uh, one of the reasons why this is. I mean, this is now very popular is that 
um, today we would understand that for those who are familiar with you know how most of these um, software engineering teams um, work or are structured, you realize that typically you find a setup where people sort of create branches, like I said earlier, make their contributions into that branch, raise a pull request, a merge request whenever um, they are done with their changes. Have those merge requests, uh, have the merge request validated by um, their core developers or the core teammates. And then those, for instance, can, they can request changes if changes are important. And if those changes are not important, they accept the changes that the person has made to the code base and then they merge or they add that person's contribution to the stable part of the, of the code base, basically. And this is something that is a popular cycle amongst software development teams. But one very interesting thing that happens again, you know, within the continuous integration setup is that because there are, like I said, there are certain components or tools that are that have been built or that exist in today's world for easy, like easy um facilitation of continuous integration. Those tools allow for um tests or checks to be done before um your pocket of code or uh, say your pull request for instance can be merged into the stable portion of the code. I'm using these technologies just so that I can carry along those people who are not so familiar with the um lingos or like the vocab vocabularies or software engineers basically. Right. So please ask me any questions. If you don't understand what I'm trying to say, I'm trying you know, so hard to make sure that I can use technologies that people are really familiar with so that I don't wind up confusing you instead of actually explaining stuff to you. So that's a bit of the motivation and that's what continuous integration means, um, you know, um, generally, that's what it means generally. So one of, one of the things I like to talk about is what are the components of continuous integration, right? What are the popular components that you see with continuous integration? Or well, before that, yeah, let's talk a bit about like the advantages of CI, CI continuous integration. One of the very, very important advantages is the fact that people can get feedback very quickly. So like I said earlier, you know, when I experienced what I said happened to, to my contribution where a developer actually mistakenly like, uh, I won't say deleted, but they just mistakenly, I mean, lost track of my contribution because at the time there wasn't, like I said, the organization was working with him by our, um, you know, impartial control to at the time. So I had a situation where, you know, a developer couldn't find my contribution or parts of my contribution rather. And it took quite some time. As a matter of fact, it was when the application was posted into a remote server. That was when I figured out that, oh, so this application is not working very well. And, um, you know, some portion of my contribution are missing from the application itself. And, you know, this is one very, very, very dangerous stuff. Imagine if, for instance, you work in a place like um, Amazon or, yeah, let's say Amazon. Um, and um, Amazon probably boasts of about the five, the five, uh, what's it called now? The five nines. By five nines, I mean like um, the level of availability of their software is rated like 99.999. 9 .9 That's, so it means that they have less than about, uh, about 40, 48 hours downtime in, in a year, you know? And that's like, anyway, if you're not familiar with that concept, please forgive me and ignore that just a fault. What I'm trying to say is that applications like AWS try to stay online for as long as possible because so many people are relying on their software to actually foster their own applications too, isn't it? So imagine for instance, that someone makes a contribution, maybe a member of their development team makes a contribution but then that contribution breaks something that is currently existing. And they, they were not able to quite give that person feedback early enough, you know, and that sort of impacted, um, that sort of impacted, apologies guys, apologies. All right, so, um, what I was trying to say is that imagine someone makes a contribution that breaks the entire AWS as you know it to be, and nobody figures that out until maybe they deploy the changes that that person needs. 
you know, that's going to impact a lot of businesses because so many people's app so many businesses' applications are hosted on AWS. So essentially, like that will cost so many people some good amount of dollars. So that's why it's very important for you know organizations to have like CI set up on their um software pipeline such such that whenever there are issues, the CI tool can pick it up very quickly and then feedback can be given to the engineer almost immediately. Some of the things I'd like to show us, I I'd like to show us a demo where we can see what an example of the pipeline and then we'll hopefully we'll be able to create that, create that together before the end of the call. So we can see you know how quickly we can actually get feedback from changes that may have broken maybe some piece of code or that is failing the test that's been written on this pipeline. The other thing again is fire related to the first one, reduced integration pain. You know, I was saying it the other time that um there was a time that you know there was a bit of a conflict between myself and another engineer as a result of the fact that we couldn't find better ways to solve, you know, um integrate our codes together. So one of the one of the things that CI prevents is that integration pain, you know. And for those who are familiar with, for instance, Git workflow or um the, you know, just a general workflow for contributing to a remote repository, we will know that there are instances where when people raise, you know, when people's changes are merged, some people use the whole idea, I mean the um, rebase cycle where they sort of rebase those changes against like the main, the um, default uh, branch of that particular repository so that they can apply those changes onto their own change before they raise their own merge request or, or pull request. Please, again, like I said, um, as a disclaimer, if I say anything that you're not familiar with, just ignore it. Uh, you know, it's not that important. I, I like the most important thing is to make sure that you can all understand what I'm trying to say. And if you've got questions, please, you can type in the chat as you're saying, just so you don't forget it. So thinking about it, or you can ask immediately. So the other thing again is improved collaboration. That's also you know quite related to the reduced discretion thing. Bug detection. One thing that the CI allows us to do is to add like um test checks or like bug checks to our pipeline. It's going to be so just to give you a proper scenario. You can write a piece of code for those who are familiar with unit tests and integration tests, right? You can write a piece of code that checks the functionality of an application. And every single time, so developers usually write integration and, and, and unit tests a lot. But also we know today that uh, there is a role called um, software developers in tests, am I correct? I think software developers, software engineers in tests, where in testing rather, that those engineers are also responsible for writing some type of um, integration or end-to-end -end tests, right? That is um, that allows them a bit of a peek into what the developer has done. Sometimes it's black box, sometimes it's white box. Well, it just depends on how much, how what level of um, what I say awareness they are with like what has been written in, in that code base. So the point is that you can have integration tests written inside of your code base. Where integration and unit tests, where whenever anybody deploy, I mean, um, raises a peer or tries to get their changes into the stable parts or portion of the code base, those tests will run, those checks will, will be made. And then if anything that they've just added to the code results in, the, in breaking changes, you know, that particular contribution will not be allowed to be added to the main parts of the code, the stable part of the code. So that, that person can make changes to that particular aspect before their changes are accepted. And that is one very important aspect of um, the CI CD pipeline or the CI, um, uh, the, the old CI um, facility. It ensures that quality can be assured, you know, in a consistent and in a way, in a consistent manner, in a way that that inspires confidence. One very good example is we we are all familiar with or at least a good number of us is that are familiar with the old um, smoke tests, right? Because I imagine we've got in a number of QA people on the call and or scientific tests rather. So for instance, you can have like a, 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 um, an automation script that contains some sanity checks, maybe to sort of check like the critical um, functionality of the application itself. And then to make sure that, you know, before 
changes are merged into, say, the production environment, they can be validated properly. And so those things, those checks will run on the CI pipeline. And then if any of the contributions that just been added breaks anything, you, know, you can easily pick those those um, those issues. And then that particular change will not be allowed to be added to what people will now see as a light application. So that's one very important aspect of it. Then also, it reduces the amount of time that is required to integrate changes. So instead of developers or QA people or designers to sit down and start saying, oh, this is where I made my change, this is where I made my change. You don't have to do that with the CI setup or CI tools. You can just basically just allow the CI tools to do their own job. Whereas, like, like I said, there is the whole idea of, I mean, magic request or pull request that comes with um, the, the version control tools that allows very easy and effective code contributions and code integration. You know, so those are some of the notifications. So let's look at the components of CI, CD, or CI rather. So one very important component, like I said, version control. So I'll just be speaking to both the version control and the code repositories together since they are all pointing to the same code. So typically, uh, yeah, this chart, I could use this to really explain what I'm saying. So it's a typical contribution cycle we go like this where a developer writes a piece of code, you know, on their local machine. And then when they write this piece of code on their local machine, after they are done with making their changes, you know, it's it, it, it will be time for them to sort of add those changes they've made into the main um, branch. I don't want to use branches, but <laughs> I can't think of any other, any other way to describe it. So, you know, they will want to add this change into the stable part of the application where people can see you know, the, the uh, implication of those changes. But in order to do that, if you've got like a CI, I mean, if you've got a CI pipeline set up, what will happen is that they may be required to maybe raise a type of request. I'll show us, I've been saying um, merge request, pull request, I'll show us what I mean by that. Where basically that request is to say that I'm done with my changes. The request is going to contain a place where they can add the description of the changes they've made. Some organizations or teams actually automate that part. But then they, they'll be able to sort of describe the changes they've made. And then once they've done that, if they've got like, if their team has like integration and unit tests within the code base, some of which they would have written to sort of cover all the scenarios that describes that particular change they've just done. So that automated um, test, if properly set up on the CI2, would first run first. Before it runs, the source code will be built on the CI2. So the CI2 always com comes with, um, what's it called? Runners, like servers of their own, where it could be instances that, you know, depending on how it's set up, can run multiple applications. Most tools use Linux. Most um, tools basically use a Linux distribution as the base server. And then depending on how you set up your YAML file, it's, it's possible that they, they just, I mean, it is containerized right on that server. So they just spin up, spin up um, maybe an image that covers that particular application, I mean, just an application software or framework. So for instance, if you're running like a Python application now on the CI2, you would have a Python image that just runs as the base image and then basically tries to build your 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 um, application. So when I say build, what I mean is this. This step where the source code is built, it just simply means that the source code is either transpiled or compiled, depending on what languages, I mean, um, the application is written in. So basically, the meaning of transpiling or compiling is to make sure that it's like the, the software is just, in by transpiling or, or compiling, it means that the software is converted into executable files that can run on the computer, right? And so basically it does that first. And once it's able to guarantee that that particular contribution can run on the computer, it just runs the automated test to be sure that everything is fine. There's a problem detected. And like I said, it can references to whether or not the CI was properly set up. If there was a problem detected, it will just basically not allow that contribution to be added to the main code base. But if everything is fine, then 
the merge request can then be accepted by maybe every maybe other engineers after reviewing the code base, I mean the code contribution. And then finally, it can be merged into um, the stable application or the stable branch data program. So ignore this for the ignore this for the moment. I'll come back to this. So that's essentially the responsibility of a code repository and the testing and the version control. Other things again, we've also mentioned like testing, you can add um tests, I mean like test runners or like um some instruction that allows tests to be run just before good contributions can be accepted in the pipeline. Also, the automated builds, like I said, uh, the builds can actually take this way before you know the um tests run so that if by building, like I said, it's like essentially trans transpiling or compiling, making that source code or what that person has contributed executable, just to check if what that person has done can be executed on a normal computer or a phone. If it can be executed, obviously, pipeline will again tell the person that, um, um, you know, there's an issue and then they can go fix it before those changes can be accepted. So, yes, yeah, so those are essentially the components or all the related things that you, you find when we're discussing continuous integration. Obviously, there are more of them, but this is like a simplified example. So let's talk about continuous delivery. I'm trying to go fast because we've spent you know quite some time already. So continuous delivery is similar to continuous integration. The only difference is that continuous delivery or continuous deployment simply speaks to the deployability of the application once verification has been made. By verification, I mean all the checks on the CI to make sure that nothing, I mean, to make sure that the contribution that is made by an engineer, for instance, are good enough to go without any issues. So once all the checks runs and they pass correctly, they are allowed, like I said, to be merged into the main branch, default branch, or a stable portion of the application. Uh, at that point, you know, the code, the code cannot just stay on the version control too, right? It has to go into a life environment that people can actually use it. And so in this definition, the term production is used to describe any type of remote environment, you know, because in so many organizations, they have multiple environments that allows proper checks to be done before people who are end users can actually see changes to the application. So in very, very familiar terms would be like staging, testing environments, and then the production environment itself. And then in most organizations, the way that this controls delivery pipeline, or in this step, in this case, I'll try I'll, I'll, I'll try to use the CI and the CD pipelines. The way that they are designed is that once contributions are accepted and next into the main branch, right? Um, Depending on some, some allow this to happen manually, whilst some actually trigger it automatically. Once they are matched into sense, I mean the main branch or a specific branch that mirrors the particular environment. What happens next is that some checks are also done to validate the deployability of the um, entire application. So it's possible that those tests that ran before that contribution was to meet. Would also run again depending on how the test, how the organization set up their um, pipeline, right? And when those checks run, um, if those checks, if the um, contribution passes those checks, then the contribution is allowed to be deployed into that environment. So it could either be a test environment where the software testers can actually now take their time to go through it, or maybe a staging environment that mirrors where product guys like the um product manager product owners where they can validate what the developers have done already after it has gone through QA so that they can maybe have a show and tell with the business or the client just before you know so they get to sign up and approve before they can actually add you know I mean um uh, request that releases meet to the live environment that's the main one that mirrors what people actually see as end users so like I said, um, it's quite flexible in terms of how you look at it, how you can look at it. But the most important thing to keep in mind is that you can have an exhaustive amount of checks on the, usually the number of checks on the CI pipeline is, is um, lesser than the number of checks you find on the CD pipeline. 
But essentially, like I said, um, there is no C C D pipeline without a CI pipeline, isn't it? So the code contribution has to be merged together and accepted first before they can be deployed. And so the CD is responsible for basically ensuring that um, code contributions or changes that is made to a particular code base or a product can be moved successfully into environments that are like where people can actually interact with those changes. And there might be some, diff I mean, different levels of um, approvals that are required before those changes can be seen in the right environment. One, one of the things I did say is that, um, you know, you've got all these environments, different organizations have different ways to sort of manage the, the rollout of changes from one, one stage to the other. And on, on the basis of that, you can have um, one to 10 amount of 10 tech checks. It could be the same check on the same, um, on, on the different sides of the pipeline, just to make sure that it is probably, it is properly scrutinized before changes, and I mean, before life, life release and So that's one to keep in mind. Like I said, um, just to go through the slide, um, one of the motivations or some of the reasons why we do this is reliable release. And I saw in fact that when I was saying the other time that, um, you know, checks we made before those things are released into environments to, to reduce like errors or impacts from um, mistakes that people have made in the code base and stuff. So I would like to describe what I've just said now using this particular diagram. Remember I spoke about like the developer making their own contribution the other time. And so once they make their contribution, what usually happens is that they raise a kind of, I mean, they 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 commit, uh, let me follow that thing, this graphic commit. They sort of, they, um, for the lack of better words, just uh, permit me to still say they commit, they use, they, they kind of make sure that that change is identifiable once they make that change. And then the request for that change should be accepted into the uh, main code. And so once, depending on how or what they are using to achieve that, you will see the case for a large request or a pre-request like I said earlier. And so once that is done, it gets accepted into, there, there will be checks obviously to make sure that the, um, what's it called? This can be done into this place or can be accepted here. And that those are some of those checks are is what is described here. So in most cases, you see a do the first run to make sure that when the application gets into a computer, it does not break, right? It can produce, it can easily produce executable files. After that, unit test is carried out to make sure that what that person has just added now, you know, this is passing all the tests that they've written, even on a remote environment, because I don't know if you guys have heard this because a lot of developers would say something like, oh, it worked on my computer. Like if once it goes, once there are changes, you know, gets to QA and the QA is saying, ah, guys, this your change is not working. But like, well, it was working on my computer now, you know? So this is where all of those checks can be done to make sure that such scenarios don't become like a regular, like a regular thing. So the unit test run, integration test run, there can be an exhaustive list of checks. Like I said here, you can have smooth tests. You can have even the test that automation, automation script written by QA guys added to this point. It could be added to this point as well, like I said. And so depending on the organization, you can have like a review app created once that change is accepted into this place. That review app can be looked into. If it is okay, they allow for a release to go into the staging environments. The review app can also make for the QA environments where QAs can actually check that and make sure that whatever, um, you know, whatever changes was introduced to the code or the application does not break and also meets up all the acceptance criteria that's been written for those changes. So once they are, once that's been accepted, a release is done into the staging. Most times this mirrors um, an environment where product and business can actually check the application. And finally, you've got the production environments where end users can get a feel for um, that application. Okay, so let's quickly look into like the benefits. One of them is faster time to market. Obviously, we've spoken a bit about that business agility, um, quick feedback. You've got like quick releases, quick release cycle. One thing we didn't speak about earlier is the rollback effort. So there are instances where maybe a particular change had gone through checks right but for some reason those changes um maybe businesses decides that they don't want that change to actually go into production where users can see it maybe as a result of it being discussed or maybe 
for some business reasons they don't want that it is always it would have been very difficult to i mean like the typical way it should have been handled without a CI/CD pipeline would have been that they would uh, maybe the developer they would ask the developer to go look into the code and remove the code contribution that was needed that sort of you know introduced that particular change right which can be very hectic so but with the likes of CI with the CI/CD tools it is it could just be a matter of a click of a button and change will be rolled back to the previous version. So that's one very important aspect and you know why this is really good. User-centric testing, yeah, we've, talked, we've spoken about this as well. So this is essentially like um, some of the uh, um, the important motivations for the CI CD pipeline. So components of CI CD or of the CD, version control, like I said earlier, um, sorry, let me go back one step. Apologies, guys. I'm going too fast. All right. So the DevOps tools is one, like um, a server. So we are, some of us are familiar with all these cloud services like GCP, that's the Google Cloud service, or even the local ones like Hostinga and likes like um, Heroku uh, or um, AWS and so many other environments. So um, this um, some of them like you can think of some of them as host environments you know they are places where you can deploy your applications to so that it can be accessible to people online um apart from that yeah, there are also things like test runners and like um automation um or deployment deployment automation tools i, I like to think of them as DevOps tools right and these tools example of these tools are even the gitlab runner the github runner work workflows you have got like check-ins for some people. Might, some people might be familiar with check-ins and a couple of other ones like that. So there are so many of these tools out there. There's also the version control tools, GitLab, GitHub, Bitbucket, and the likes. So these tools essentially allow us to be able to do continuous delivery. Now, one thing that I'd like to cover is the general and overall benefits of CI/CD. So overall benefit is essentially reduces errors. You know increases the ability to collaborate without any, you know, without all the underlying issues with, you know, human errors um, and, you know, portability of changes and all of that stuff. So it just essentially reduces the amount of time that a developer or an QA person has to verify a particular contribution before they are accepted. Because once this is set up, automatically verifications can take place on the pipeline. So that just cuts down the time required to sort of fix bugs and to figure out bugs. Also, it makes for very good work um, ethic in the sense that developers easily begin to sort of develop this culture where they make sure that their contribution makes sense or like it's good enough before it goes in. They will basically write their unit tests, also make sure that the existing tests that's been written on the application are passing best before they can request for their changes to be managed. So basically, it's just like it's just like oil, oil on a machine. It makes everybody behave in a manner that is consistent with it for a particular product. So there are a, like a host of um, benefits, but I, I don't want to go through everything right now. Um, I imagine I could let us have an access to the slides once I'm done with, with my um, with my talk. The other thing I wanted to mention again is apart from benefits, there are also drawbacks, right? And these drawbacks. You know, sometimes generally in software engineering, there is no hard or fast rule. You just always have to think about what are the trade-offs, right? So the, one of the major issues with CI CD is um the, the amount of ambiguity and like sometimes uh time it takes for all these checks to be reviewed. So you can have some checks on your version control tool that prevents people from merging. And then the person might not be available to fix that particular check very well. And then you just that thing will just be there. Sometimes you have situations where there is no issues on the pipeline. People are just not, have just refused to review that particular code. And maybe there are some rules on that particular branch that says, or that particular pipeline that says that if you don't get people to accept your changes, your change cannot be merged. So for that reason, you find out that some people's change can stay on for a very long time because people continue to review them and just start speaking about things that don't really matter just to keep that particular work there for a very long time. So there are obviously issues, but if you think about the issues, right? If you weigh the benefits, the benefits obviously outweighs the issues that you see in CI/CD, and that's why a lot of organizations implement it. So that's like that in a nutshell. 
So how do you implement CICD? So I would not want to sort of talk too much about this right now. But what I'll just say is that generally, um, in most organizations, what happens is that the most organizations implement varying um, levels of CICD um, facilities or infrastructures, depending on the size of the organization, the structure of the organization, um, their capacity and their financial strengths and the size of their products, right? What I mean by this is that some organizations can have an exhaustive, like a very complex system to ensure that contributions are, you know, um, are very carefully scrutinized before they have a whole pipelines. And why? Because their product might require that. So imagine that you are building an application and you work in NASA, and then, um, you know, your application essentially manages rocket launching or like flight into space. You know, there is like almost zero margin for errors. So they can spend so much money on infrastructures to make sure that those pipelines are, are up there to prevent any possible errors that might be introduced into the general code. Also, um, you can have organizations where all those things don't matter. They don't really need to have like a very complex pipeline, They're just something that works. So there is no um, out of fast when it comes to things like this. Just make sure that you've got a pipeline that is set up to sort of verify the implementation that people are you know, making before it is added to the main code, and also to make sure that they are easily deployable to whatever environments that, that exist in the organization for checking stuff and for ensuring that people can, I mean, end users can have access to changes. So it's it's more or less like a business decision, but like I said, proper strategies have to be put in place to make sure that testing can be carried out on those pipelines. And also every other, every stakeholder in the organization understands the importance and can actually play along and just basically just get on board with it. So we can learn a bit more about implementation. I'd like to take 15 or about 10 minutes to show us um, a very simple demo as to what you know continuous integration continuous delivery looks like. So for this to work, I'm going to be using, you know, I mentioned some components, right? I'm going to be using a version control tool called GitHub. A couple of us are familiar with it already. And also basically I'll use um, GitHub's workflow. So GitHub has something very similar to Jeffrey's, which is an automation tool that allows people or Travis here, you know, it's it's a tool that allows people to basically um, add their changes and have their changes validated. So you would typically add like a YAML file. Let me just make sure I start very quickly because of our time. Um, so just to make it very easy because of our time, I, would, I wouldn't want to write it with the code. I'll just um, create a simple folder and then copy some of my changes, some of the code that I have on my system into it so that we can easily deploy it to an environment and see what I've so let's see, I'm gonna call this uh, the CI demo. Yeah. And so I'm going to, um, um, let me see, let me just um, check into that particular process. So I'm going to just go into that particular folder I just with it now. And then um, add a couple of changes to it. So I will add, first of all, let me let me initialize this particular folder with Git. So I just created so that this folder basically becomes like a Git repository. Because remember, one of the things we said that is important in CI CD is basically having like a fashion control to a repository to manage changes that are made, right? So by just being by, by typing this command now, I've essentially um, um sort of initialized Git, making sure that Git is aware of the changes that are making into this particular folder. So I'll be setting up a simple backend server. It's not going to take, just going to take a few minutes that would um, contain all of the changes that will be deployed. The backend server would be able to allow us access to particular endpoints that we can use to sort of get simple messages. So to do that now, uh, I'll create uh, a couple of files. Let me create an entry point file called uh, app.js. Let's be sure that it's in the right place. I'm going to copy a piece of coding to that particular file just so that I save time. So that's it. If you, you want to see the other files there, so go one file in there. So I'll add 
other files like um, there's already a package.json file. Correct. Oh, no kidding. There's no package.json file. Let me click at that in there. So now we shall have to just some part there. Um, the other things I'd like to add, well, let me, let me, oh, sorry. So the thing is for those that are not familiar with the way terminals work, let me just make sure that you can see what I'm trying to do inside of a code editor instead. I think this is much better. So I basically added um, just two files, this file and then this file, right? And then the next thing I want to do is I'm going to create a YAML for, I mean, I'm going to create a, a folder that will contain instructions that will allow kids to be able to understand what I wanted to do once I add changes to, I mean, how I wanted to sort of verify changes made to this particular um, software, the one that we're writing currently. What I'm going to do is I will set up simple instructions allowing kids to know what checks to carry out and like I said, uh, some of the checks that is important is carrying out a build check to make sure that that particular application can build correctly on the computer. And also running a couple of, you know, unit tests, inspection tests to make sure that, you know, nothing is breaking whilst adding those changes. So I'm going to add those instructions now. I'll add it to this file. Usually, whenever you want to add instructions, develop instructions, the typical file to use is called a YAML file. YAML file essentially like, any other file format, but basically has some ways to sort of write instructions. So I'm going to lift a particular piece of instruction. I'll explain what 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 is here so that we can understand. So it's not like I'm just um, copying and pasting stuff. But I'll come back to this file in one minute. I want to make sure that we have other files here. So I'm just going to add like a signal file. I'm going. To just um, I don't need to know the modules here for a reason. And then I think finally, okay, yeah, I'm gonna do this first. And then let me quickly explain what is here. So this file is a YAML file. It's basically an instruction file that tells GitHub workflow. GitHub workflow is very similar to Travis CI or um uh, maybe Jackson, for instance. And what this will do for you is that it will allow you to be able to run some checks on your program so that those checks are validated for consistencies and to make sure that they pass before they can, you know, contributions can be allowed to be added to the main or stable aspect of the code base that I said. Now, one thing you observe on this check is there are some instructions that are very, um, that are um, English-like in the sense of what's what they imply the first thing here says pull request so this particular aspect of this uh, file essentially these are basically um so this is this part is called the jobs while this part is called a trigger so basically to tell um the github workflow which is like i said um in dev of two to tell it that whenever a pull request is made to this particular branch here this branch, the main branch you're seeing here, is where the main and the most consistent aspect of the code lives, right? And whatever we are doing about outside the main branch does not really matter as much. It's, they are mostly referred to as feature branches, whilst this one is the one that mirrors either, you know, the production environment, for instance. So we are saying that whenever someone says he wants to add these changes to this place, please, um, the workflow, run these jobs here and only allow this person to go on, you know, give a status a status on, you know, their contribution on the basis of the instructions under these jobs. So we only have one job, and job is called build and, and test. You can typically name this anything. It could be um, IO and daily, it doesn't really matter. And so we are saying that the base environment where this will run is Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a Linux distribution. It's basically like your computer. So we're just saying, please use this base environment. And we're saying in the steps, Right, there is this um, library. I'll call it a library that uh, is available on on GitHub. It downloads this. This is just essentially supposed to allow us to be able to set up this environment. I mean, set up uh, an environment where these checks can be done. This one also helps us to install Node.js in that environment. So basically, to specify what which Node.js version will be needing to test this particular code. And it's important because 
you want to make sure that the computer, the server that runs um, your software, right, is consistent with the server where checks can be run so that in the event that, because you know that case where I said someone can say, ah, something was working on my computer but it's not working on the live environment, you know, this is where you can make sure you tackle that kind of issue by making sure that whatever um, um, environment or computer that will be running the checks is consistent with both your life environment and the local environment so that there are no issues of it running here and not running in your life environment. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind here or to take note of here are the steps for this particular job. So one other step you see here is called the installation step or the install dependency step. Basically, what the step does is that it would install all the things that this application needs to actually work. So essentially, that dependent, those dependencies can be found in the package.json file. We're going to add a couple of these dependencies in a moment. So I need to make sure that you guys are, family, are, are aware of that. Finally, we'll be adding a test script to this application. And then that test script is going to be validated before this code can be accepted into the main branch. So let's quickly do that in, let me see. Um, I'll wrap up in, in um, we'll be done in less than uh, 19 minutes, just to make sure that we can leave it by So the next part that I'll be adding right now is, uh, first of all, let me make sure that this is, this whole setup works properly. We need a couple of things to make sure this works. We need uh, this ExpressJS server. So I'm going to install that now. So we installed this. So now um, I think we can just to make sure that we can test this application to show it works. Let me see if we've got the browsing. So um, let me move this to the PTV from here. Now I'll just add um, a start script. So yeah, we can start this application now to see if if it is working. Remember that we have um, a log here that says, once the application starts listening on this port 300, it's supposed to log out or print out this stuff. This is a way to know that this application actually works. So basically, let's try that and see. So it works, right? We can test again a bit by making a request on the, on, let me make sure that we can do that. So let's say I come here and I type localhost 3000, right? Let me take this out. It's supposed to show us, okay, yeah, hello, yeah, so the application actually works. So now the next thing we want to do is write a couple of tests, right? Just to make sure that this application can be tested all the time when we make, when we add contributions. So for that, I'm going to add a file here for test, let's call it test.js, right? And then I'm going to leave the, like a very small piece of code that is already, I, I wrote just a couple of minutes before we started, for the slow we can at this demo. And then I'm going to take this one out. This one is supposed to break the code. Um, it's basically, it basically asserts that um, the response, the status of the um, response from this particular class was 400, when in fact it was supposed to be 200. So see, we're sending a response of 200 to um, to the client whenever I request this to that particular API. Now, what you see here is that this is a test. This is a test suit. This test suit essentially uses Mocha. We're going to install Mocha in a moment as the test runner. And basically, char and char HTTP for assertion. So this is basically an assertion library char and this HTTP asserts, but asserts for um assertion means check, check, checking. And so basically, this checks for API calls. This is just the general assertion library. So all right, all right, all right. So let's just quickly move on. Um, so basically we have everything we need right now, except for the um, repository I mentioned. So we're gonna use GitHub. But before I, I go, let's test, let's make sure that this our test is passing, isn't it? So before we can do that, let's install um, Mocha and a couple other things we need to actually run that test. So I'm gonna install them as dev dependencies because they are not necessary in the um, life um environment basically. So I'm gonna install this. Install char HTTP. 
And then what else did we use to get Kim Walker? I think this is all we need. What else? Yeah, that's all. So once this installs, we'll run our test and see if our test is running successfully. If our test pass, then obviously like we'll get a go or a green on this. Right. So let's let's run our test. Um, oh, sorry, we haven't added the test command. Um, where is it again? It's okay. Let's just add more car. Uh, I think we need to sort of make sure that it can time out. Uh, hold on a minute. Else it's just going to get stuck. So we'll add a timeout. Okay, thousand. But let's just say 10,000 milliseconds. That's 10 seconds. So then, but let me, make it, let me make it less than that. Let me make it uh, maybe 5,000. And then. Um, Make sure that it exits. I would have explained this, but it's not important. So let me run the test again and see. No, okay, so you can see that our test is passing, isn't it? If we wanted this to fail, we can just basically say this should return 400 instead of uh, like 500 instead of 200. I remember that this is supposed to return 200, right? So if we run this test again, you see that now it's going to fail, right? So it's failing. So what we want is that whenever anybody adds anything that fails and there's a test for it on the CI pipeline, we want this to actually show up, right? So we're going to do that now. And remember that you see this command I ran the other time. Remember that I ran a couple of commands. This is an installation command, right? Just to install the dependencies we need. Remember we also ran this command, npm test, to make sure we can run our test, isn't it? Now, let me just quickly show you that on the YAML file where we had our instructions, we did the same thing. This is where we are asking the, um, the uh, what's it called now? Our, our DevOps to, to actually install all the, the um, dependencies we need to test this particular uh, contribution. Then this is where we're asking it to actually run the test. So now we are done with everything we need to do with regards to building. Let's just go very quickly to GitHub and create a, a repository. It's quite very easy to create one. Um, uh, sorry, but mm, go back here. Yeah. All right, so we're going to call this CI demo. And then we don't need to add any descriptions for the moment. This is just basically a very an empty repository. First thing we're going to do is let's commit the changes that we need here. Make sure that we can, let me clear so we can see from up top. Now I'm going to add these changes um, again. Sorry, I'm going to commit these changes. Let's call it the uh, press commit just for the purpose of this. Usually that's what you find. Oh, okay. Let me see. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, we have yeah, we have this already. Okay, great. So now we we'll ideally rename this now, but I'll just prefer to copy the command for the renaming here. So I also rename this to the main. That's why I'm doing this. And then we can add this. We want this particular changes to mirror this particular remote repository. So by doing this now, you'll be aware of this remote repository. So once we push our changes now you will see it on the live environment. So this would be updated in a moment to have those changes that we just added. So think of this, let me see as it goes through. So let me reload. Think of this as a stable code. Remember that our test was passing before I pushed it. So think of this as a stable code. So imagine if a developer wants to actually add his own changes for the first time, maybe he's working on a feature Let's call this um, test branch. I think I already have something like this. Anyway. So let's say this is this is um, a developer right now, and the developer now wants to introduce his own changes, right? Let's say he wants to add his own changes to the code and all of that. Maybe he's trying, he's working on a particular feature. Now, developer will typically come, do all his work in this space, right? And by the time he is done, maybe, oh, I just made a mistake. Sorry, guys. 
But yeah, it's even it's actually a good mistake. It's just a problem. So maybe he mistakenly broke something that cost our server to return an error. Okay, in fact, you know, normally our server is supposed to return 200. Let's see our, our server. Let me change this here and just write. Let's say he did some kind of stuff, right? And our server started returning um, a 400 instead of, let me see, it started returning a 400 instead of a 200, right? So it's failing because something broke. Um, let's just say, yeah, it's JSON instead of text, it's content type. So now this is, these are the changes the developer made. Our tests now would be failing because the status is supposed to come from here. We had already expected it was going to be 200, but because the developer has made some changes to our code and he has broken it, when he pushes to the CI pipeline, the CI would catch the issues that he has um, created as a result of his own changes. And then, you know, to stop the guy from being able to merge his code into the main one unless he fixes those changes. One thing I'd like to do before we continue is I want to add, I want to add the rules here that makes sure that that actually happens. I propose to do that. So we want to add the rule on this on this place here. I'm going to call this main. Um, I want to say that that rule will check for require status checks to pass before. Yeah, so it's going to check for status checks. Uh, oh, there are no status checks currently. Okay, so guys, just give me one sec. Let's push what we currently have now and see what happens. So I'm going to add this change. I'm going to comment and write filling. And then, so we're going to push this just to origin. And, sorry, guys. All right. So by the time we come here, we'll see this change. It's typical for a developer to now raise a PR at this point or a pull request saying that they are done with what they are doing and they want to add this to the main aspect of the code or the main branch. Now, after the wrist that is here, look at what is going to happen at this point. You see that, okay, it says require approval from specific. So let's add, so can you see that this has started running? Some checks haven't completed yet. So it has started running this uh, check. Let me show you what is going on. You see, it's set up. Remember our instructions now, like, let me, Go back here and show you. Remember our instructions here. The first thing we said was to these are the steps. So it runs this, it sets up, it installs Node.js into the Ubuntu server, right? It installs this, right? And then it runs the installation here and then it runs the test, right? So let's quickly look at that. So can you see that the installation is done at this point? But by the time it got to run tests, I run build and test. See, this is failing, isn't it? It's failing because we expected a 200 response from the server, but the server is now returning a 400. So what's going to happen is that this person will not be able to merge this particular code. Can you see that there's an X here saying that it has failed? At the moment, eh, because I've not added that rule, I can almost made, I can merge because I've not done that already. Can you see that? But let's quickly go and add the rule that says, never allow someone to merge unless that person, I mean, unless that person's, um, what's it called, um, changes actually passes, passes um, the checks. So let me just clear this here. I'm going to check for, uh, what's it called again? Um, I think build. Yeah, build and test. So let me create this. Awesome, so it's been created. So let's go back to that particular pull request and look at it again. Now you see that there's no way this person will be able to merge with these changes he has made. So you can see it says um, required status must pass before merging, right? And that particular change has failed. I mean, the, the check has failed. So there's no way. It can merge. I have, by the way, I have some permissions that can allow me to bypass that. That's because I created this repo. But I can block this if I want to block this as well. So generally, any other person who comes and tries to merge, the merge button will not be active unless their changes is passing on the CI2. So one way to make it pass, right, would be to make some changes here, right? So I can come into the code base. I'll realize, oh, I made it, I, I made a mistake, right? 
I broke the code. So I can just basically fix the code. After fixing the code, I will again right, add my changes or commits. And let's call this passing commits. Right. And then let's push this. So, yeah. So in, in the moment I push that change, you see, it just came in now, what I just pushed. So it will rerun this particular check to see if, you know, everything is all good. So just watch after it, the start rerunning the test, the uh, check. That's why this is yellow at the moment. So let's take a look at what it is doing. This one is also failing. Let me check why it's failing. Oh, 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 I see why it's failing. Remember that what we added here, we added a check here that says that, um, and by the way, I'm getting, as it is failing, I'm getting emails. Just watch this. Let me show you. So that's the, immediate feedback that, that I said you, you'll be getting once um, things are failing. So you can quickly, rapidly work on those changes. So it says that, you know, these two commits are failed. I mean, the PR that led to this, you can see that it's telling me that uh, this field, I can check the workflow, 10 seconds and it failed. You know, saying this also just failed now. So let's quickly fix all the issues so that we can have a passing build, right? So let me go back here and make those changes again. So. I mean to say we would be sending text inside now instead of uh, this stuff. Let me copy the tests, the uh, um, I mean the text that we are going to be sending, and this is here. So now we can actually validate this in our local to be sure, like in our local um, um repository to be sure that this works. Can you see it's passing now on our local repository before it's that field? So let me add this change. We're almost done, guys. Real passing coming. Yeah, almost done. So now let's go and validate this. Let's go back to our PR. You see, one, another one has started running again. Let's see if this time it's going to pass. This is it here. We can monitor it real time. You can see that it is showing the progress. We can monitor it real time by going and checking the details here. Oh, by the way, see, passes now. Can you guys see? It? So it's passing now. So, and what you also notice is you can see the check mark here that says it's passing. What are you going to notice? You notice that now the button to merge has become active, right? So it means that we can actually make this successfully into the code base and bang, you know, we're done. So our changes have now, has now been accepted into this particular page. You can see that, look at the comment that led to that change one minute ago, and that's it. So guys, that's um, a very short demo. I'm sorry, I took so much time to explain this. Well, you know, like I said, there's a first for everyone. This is my first, I guess next time it's going to be a bit shorter. So to conclude on this, right, basically you guys can see how important CICD is. And I don't need to mention that it's going to reduce or essentially reduces um, errors, makes collaboration easier, you know, allows feedback to happen as fast as possible. So yeah, um, obviously I can't cover everything here, but this is just to sort of introduce us to the old concept of CICD. Thank you so much for your time. Please feel free to ask me any questions now. Thanks a lot, um, Aridini. Very much appreciated. And I, for one, learned a lot. And I hope I'm speaking for everyone else by saying we also learned something very, very good today. And it's going to help us in our day to day, whether it is as uh, entry level or those that have been in the industry that your question or your your teaching has kind of helped them remember or better understand something. So thank you very much. And does anyone have any question before we bring the night to a close? Five minutes, please, questions.
Hi, Paris. Please go ahead. Yeah, all right. Thank you so much, Kayo. Um, so the question that I have is on the um parts where there is deploy the deployment stage, like when you want to deploy the code. I understand. I wanted to know if I'm getting the bigger picture of CI/CD first from the integration part, where um the quality assurance of the part the particular code is like um them having a particular spot where they like you said a base code and when there's this base code other developers can have a feed from it and make their own version of the code now is it that their own version of the code is fixing the code or let me say they have an update and they want to upgrade it from the base code and they just want to add their code or they just actually want to just make their own version of the code to make the application run smooth. So that is the first step. And then the deployment stage, um, you said is going to be harder. Does that not, how I put it, does that not uh, go against one of the first thing principles that says um, early testing is better? Like I'm talking about in the small phase of the CI CD now. The bigger phase is the whole software development cycle. But the small phase of CI CD, does that not go against the whole um like it's that first testing principle where you have to test early? Why not make it tougher in the integration stage or like you understand what I'm saying in the CI stage than in the CD pipeline? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I like to I like to take all the questions together because of our time. So if you've got more questions, please feel free to ask your questions so that I can answer them together. Are there any more questions? So I guess we don't have any more questions coming. All right, so I'll try and explain this for the benefit of those who, and who are not able to ask their own questions. Sorry to everything. cut it short. Ibn's hand is raised so he can ask his question. Just go ahead with your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, my question is um, the deployment part. Uh, are we also writing a different code to like deploy? to production or we are using the same um, YAML file? Yeah, that's a very good question. That is a very, very good question. All right, I'll answer that too. All right, any further questions? So if you're raising your hands, I, like I, I won't be able to see it, that's the issue. Okay, I think I'll be able to see it now. Paris, you're on the still wrist. I hope it's from the previous question you asked. Is it from the previous question you asked? Oh, okay, cool. I see your answer down now. Any more questions, guys? Okay, I suppose we don't have further questions, so... Before I answer those questions, I, like I said, I want to make sure that I'm carrying everybody along and I'm not even confusing us any further, right? So what I would do is I would explain an aspect of this thing so that it can be clearer. So, so basically, like a couple of us will be familiar with how a software team works. Typically, we get like software teams usually get requirements from the business or the product people. About what has to be built, isn't it? So what you really what you find in most cases is that they track all of those feature requests and requirements on a project management uh, or like an issue tracking to a piece of what software. Some of the very popular ones are Sana, Trello, Jira, and you know there are a plethora of those tools out there. Now, typically, a developer would create a feature branch. 
off the main branch. You remember when we actually created, let me, I'm going to show you typical examples of what I'm saying, just so that it makes sense to you. Um, but this are sort of confidential stuff. Okay, I think I can show you one that is not so confidential. Give me a moment. See, one sec. So I'm going to show you this one. By the way, it's also confidential, but like, um, just to give you an idea of what I'm saying. So most of the times, right, what you see is something like this. It could be, it could be a feature request on a bot like this, right? You guys can see this. Where, for instance, like maybe AI integration is a feature request, right? So a developer would typically move this from the to do into um, the swim lane or the column called in progress. Once they've done this, depending on some people, like there are some integrations that even exist on some of these tools that allows you to be able to create a feature branch that would mirror that particular tax you are, you're about to execute, right? So in other cases, you can just go ahead, go to the uh, with your version control tool. You can go ahead and create a branch. And once you create a branch, you will create that branch off the main branch. So you copy a version of the main branch into this branch that you have created. That's the whole idea of creating the branch. And then once you do that, you start writing your piece of contribution into that branch. So by the time you are done with that, right, how do you get your code matched or committed into the main base branch or consistent aspect of the code? One, like the, the most popular or de facto cycle to do that is through the pull request cycle, where organizations maintain that standard that for you to get your code met into the uh, main branch, which is this branch you see in a moment now, this one, this one here, you have to first create what is called a pull request. That was what we did the other time. And this is the one that we closed the other time. So once you do this, right, now, some of those instructions you've written to actually execute on your pipeline begins to run. Now, a very good question is, as a QA practitioner, are you supposed to have your own tests or automation scripts in this place? Or where exactly will your automation scripts be on the pipeline, isn't it? So now, the thing is, in most cases, you know, and just to establish this, that what you find is black box, like, like um, for QA, or QA practitioners, what they usually do is to carry out black box testing. And the fact they are carrying out, the fact that you, are, that you are writing automation scripts or you are carrying out automation testing doesn't mean that it is white box testing that you are doing. It is still black box because you may not be familiar with the underlying um, code base that has created that particular product or be able to sort of interact with it. It is even possible that all of your test scripts will be in another repository very far or different from this one where you have um where you have the main code. It's possible that you guys maintain your own separate repository where your, your test scripts will be, isn't it? Also, in some cases, some, some organizations allow for QA people to sort of add their own. So it's not like they add, they can add like um how do I put it now? An instruction inside this YAML file here that says go ahead and fetch um, the automation script in XYZ um, repository. So by the time you fetch it, run that script once these particular checks have passed. Once you run that script, make sure that that script is actually passing through before you allow that person to merge, isn't it? So you have varying setups in different organizations depending on, like I said, it goes from very simple to complex. There are no hard or fast rules. And one thing to also mention is that, remember you, you spoke about why not having all those um, QA, so, I mean, QA uh, automation scripts run at the CI stage. One thing I'd like to say is that, yeah, sure, they can run at the CI stage. It is, there are no hard or fast rules, but one thing I found it very popular with most organizations is that, the test that runs at this point are the tests written by developers themselves and not the um, the tests written by the QA people. Most times, what I find is that on the deployment aspect of things, all the, because the, the, the QA test is supposed to be, it's supposed to mirror acceptance criteria and uh, more or less 
like the experience of an end-to-end um, of a user end-to-end isn't it so most times you, you we always think of the qa test as mostly end-to-end tests and then uh, even though that is not fixed isn't it but in most cases you'll find that the test that the qa people write is for end-to-end tests and they are automation scripts are, are most akin for things like smoke testing and for regression the reason is because you want to first of all make sure that the environment is stable before you start writing scripts for it, isn't it? And if you sort of check, I'm sure that you find um very, very important information points in that direction that, you know, whenever you want to start writing your automation scripts, you probably want to write it on a more stable environment, usually for sort of, I mean, smoke testing, sanity, and then uh, uh, in, uh, regression tests, which is why, you know, they are always on the other, other side of things. That's the city side of things, because we, you know, when we mentioned CD, we said we're talking about deployability here, the ability to sort of ship that particular application or a piece of software into a production-like environment, whether it is a test environment or something on a remote server or um, the main production environment or a staging environment. Now, what happens is that the point before those environment is not as stable, right? So it is not going to be advisable if we get the QA guys to be writing uh, automation scripts that are run here because. At this point, it's possible that even all the tests that the developer wrote passes, but acceptance criteria have not been met in the code that the developer wrote. So if you now have your own code, your own automation script, which is expected to have followed all the acceptance criteria, right? So under all those acceptance criteria, if you have them run here, most times the back and forth will maybe even increase much more. So the first thing is you want to first of all make sure that um, the checks that developers have written passes all the old integration tests they've written also passes at this point so when they make this code and then it gets shipped into your own, your own environment before it gets shipped to your environment maybe it gets shipped into the test environment for instance you manually test it yeah like, oh, okay cool this thing fulfills expectation now you now write your automation test to make sure that just as it has fulfilled the expectation now not there's there shouldn't be any point in the future maybe as a result of introducing some new changes to it where to break so you add that to sort of like the um, pipeline between staging between your own test environment and staging that okay i've checked this thing it works now my automation will be on the side where i create a release from um where where the, the developer can create a release from from um, testing to staging environment so that before that change can enter into staging environment since i've already tested it manually i've written automation script for it it must pass the automation scripts right then it can then be shipped to the staging environment. So anytime it doesn't pass that, that stuff, then it means that maybe something someone else has written as a developer that he accepted has broken the underlying change. In most cases, they are testing on two sides to make sure that the code is as bug free as possible. And like, like I said, uh, I want to just infer that tests testing is done as early as possible. And that is why it is like this. You know, the whole idea is to make sure that before it gets to the end user, the tests are already done, which is why Every single time a developer writes a feature, is expected to actually write unit tests and regression tests to cover those features. Also, whenever the QA has validated that those features are working and the meet acceptance criteria, the QA adds a new automation script. Oh, sorry, a, a new test test case that covers that particular um, acceptance criteria to the automation suit, so that we can ensure steady environments where you know uh, once that code again is moved from maybe the testing environment into staging environment. You can see, you can validate it all over again to be sure that everything works fine. Now, finally, one of the things that we didn't quite see today is, you know, deploying this. This is not deployed yet. So if I had, I, maybe next time, if we are able to have this, again, maybe some kind of masterclass for this, then we can have like a robust setup where you see deployment into the separate environment. So you'll be able to see, for instance, where we might even have like, you know, um, an automation script to run at that point so that, you can see how those changes are shipped from um, the dev environment or the test environments into all those production level environments. So I hope that answers your question or your questions rather. Yes, sir. I'm there. All right. So I guess no further questions, right? Olubenga has his hands up. And I hear she please ask your question. Okay, no problem. Go on with your questions. You know. Yeah, um, good evening, guys. Apologies, I was going to give a thumbs up 
for a response, like for a well elicit response to the question. Yeah, thank you. For yeah. I mean, um, the question also led to my own question anyway. So um, yeah, very good. On this Yammer file, right on the um the action points here, right? At what points do we make reference to the QA script to have it as part of the um stages okay. for deployment? And also, is this on this same YAML file, we need to specify the environment and all the necessary dependency that okay. is needed okay. to run the QA test? Yeah, so the thing is, Typically, right, in a, in a very um, organized, and let's say in a more realistic environment or a more realistic dev team, what you would actually have is multiple YAML files. So you'd have multiple YAML files for the different environments. Some people actually allow you to use, you know, GitHub has something called secrets where you can typically add like environment variables and whatnot. Like I said, not it's not only GitHub that you've got like all these things set up. You can set it up you know, on uh, Jenkins, Travis CI and whatnot. But then making reference to GitHub, what people usually do is they use all these secrets to switch between the environment in some cases. But I've also managed or like worked, you know, where they sort of have like multiple YAML files to sort of mirror different environments. Now to also point, to speak about like the automation script, right? So uh, to be honest with you, I've worked in two different instances, which is why I always believe that there is no other fast rule. It just, it just depends on how the software team wants to manage the entire, um, um, what's it called, um, the entire instruction files. So for instance, a very good way to go is you can have your a different YAML file, for instance. So we can write another YAML file here. In fact, let me, let me instead of writing the one, let me just show you. I have like yeah, a couple of projects that have multiple ones here on my system. Just to show you like the different possible things you can see. So there is a different, in, in most cases, like depending on the organization, there are different um, files for both deployments, um, deployment to remote repositories. Like, I mean, sorry, sorry deployment to the server environments. And there are also different ones for different stuff basically. So the CD has its own deployment file. The CI has its own different deployment file. To different environments, they either switch using the environment variables or they have different YAML files running at different times. And again, what you have to keep in mind is that there are different triggers. So let me give you an instance. Say for instance, you want to, you can write several workloads. This one has like a plethora of workloads. So can see that there's one here. Right, let me let me open it in different places so you can see the different ones. Can you see? So it can be as many as possible. I'm going to tell you a bit about what you see here. So now let me show you something. So can you see that this particular one runs when when you are when you push to the main branch and when you raise a peer out to this and this? Some other ones will run when you create a release. So let me look for the, the ones that usually works when you create a release are the ones that you know deploy to a new environment. So I think. Let me see, let me see, let me see, let me see. Oh, I think, okay, I think this one. So this one now deploys to, um, this This is Elastic Container Service. Usually this one just pushes an image to the container registry. So it happens whenever a release is dispatched, isn't it? This one takes it all the way into AWS. And what you find out is you see that there are some secrets here. Can you see this? Some usually, so there are secrets everywhere, just so that it you it can dynamically determine which environments that you know they will deploy to in different moments. So, like I said, what I showed us was an oversimplified example. Can you see here that you can specify options on this one, right? Whether you want to deploy to dev production or like staging environment. So, basically, like there are a plethora of them. There is a, um, there's one I'd like to show you again. Just give me one sec. Okay, I think this one. So this one, for instance, now, hey, there's a reason why I want to show you this one. If you take a look at this, I, I wrote this one like two months ago. This particular one actually triggers, you can see that there's a base URL here. 
it triggers a particular workflow, right? That runs. That workflow is basically supposed to move things from one environment to the next. So what happens is that if this particular workflow fails, right? This, old, this deployment will not happen because it is essential for things to be properly moved across those environments before that deployment is supposed to pass. You can think of this as, um, you know, another a, a like an a URL to to trigger um, what's it called, and a script on your own side. That's the automation script, and then you can pipe the output of the automation script into the view of the user, such that once the user, and by the automation script right now, I'm referring to your, the normal QA for a QA professional, normal QA automation script. So you pipe it to the view such that whenever that particular script fails, it will run here on the server. And once it fails, it just shows an error and it shows you which of the scripts are failing. So you get the statistics to how many has passed, how many has failed. So you can pipe it into a file. And then typically this one will display you any file from a text file all the way to HTML and whatnot. You know, they, they, they've got um, the GitHub environment can actually do that for you with the proper setup. So you can actually display all the issues that happens whilst this is going on. Again, they've got like libraries that allows you to trigger, um, what's it called? Um, say for instance, you have like um, um, a code base now that is written in, um, that you've got like say Cypress, some Cypress script written in. You can trigger a build using that particular script or that particular for Cypress. And then you'll see all the logs at the point of deployment or at the point of the CI where emerging is supposed to occur. And then it's going to run. But you, like I said then, I in most cases, it's better that all those checks are done on the CD side of things because those are the side that, you know, that is involved with deployment itself and not just contribution, you know, so that because QA, QA is more concerned about what reflects the user, not necessarily what code was written by the developer, isn't it? So that's why it's always essential to have that on that side. And you can have multiple, um, multiple, what's it called, uh, YAML files describing different actions that has to be performed. One last thing is, I've seen an organization before, I won't want to mention their name, where they had their, um, they had a file within the main code base for all, all their applications where the test script for the um, testers was like they added there. So they managed the two together, like separate projects inside the same project. You get what I mean? And it works for them. And they are they are a financial organization in Nigeria here. And it works for them. So different, like it just depends on the organization and how they want to do. But I think it's just better if you maintain a separate repository for where you want to have test suits and all of those things. So that's my feedback. All right. Um. Thanks, Adrian. That does just my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, if we do not have any other question, that will bring us to the end of today's webinar. Thanks for those that started with us and stay till the end of the session. If you are interested in getting the recording we'll have it on youtube and you can rewatch it and also access the slides so that'll be all for tonight follow us on all our social media i will also be having another webinar by next week and the information is going to be shared on all our social media handles thanks everyone once again enjoy the rest of your night bye